I'm now going to hand you over to Tim uh, to do the introduction to this film and then I can press play afterwards. Right. So. Okay. But well, hello everybody and all, everyone watching the broadcast as well. I'm Tim Emblem English from Acorn Films. Uh, we are the local cine club and have been in existence since, uh, we can trace our history right back to 1951, actually, with the, the very first um, meeting of, of like-minded cine enthusiasts. Acorn Films by name came into existence in about 1986, uh, 1956, forgive me, 1956. And over the years, we've chronicled life in and around Chingford in a series of films called Chingford Newsreels. Uh, most years have had an edition up until around 2006, 2007. Um, and the earliest one that calls itself a Chingford Newsreel dates from 1956. So there are a few gaps and breaks in the series over the years when I imagine the uh, members of the society were busy with other things. Um, we've kind of sort of gone into uh, re retirement and, um, simply because most of the members have sadly passed away now. Um, I am the new boy and I joined in 1980 and I'm 62 now. Um, you will all know David Piggott who was the driving force behind the Chingford Newsreels for, for, for many, many years. And it's his voice that you hear on the commentary on very, very many of them. Um, so unfortunately he can't be here with us tonight. So you've got me instead. Um, so what we've got for part one tonight is a film that is actually one of David's productions. Um, he put together um, various bits of footage from our vaults, from our collection, um, under the heading there, as you can see on the screen, around Chingford, around Christmas. Uh, the very first piece that we will see dates from, I think, 1938, and is a very short clip of snow clearance. Um, I think it's in Ridgeway, <laughs> and along by the town hall. And we look across the road at what I think is the old parish hall that stood at the end of Organ Lane, opposite the town hall. But I'm sure, you know, that you'll have your own ideas of where we're looking. It's a very short clip, so we slowed it down. It looks a bit like it's in slow motion, but that's just to give you a chance to actually see the images because it's a very short clip. Um, then we start to get a little bit more up to date and we um, get some color and uh, eventually we get some sound, the first few So, um, yeah, so this, all, all credit to David for putting this one together. Um, I haven't had anything to do with it apart from sort of preparing it for tonight's screening, but uh, it's, it's, it's one of his productions. So, uh, right, I think we're ready to uh, roll the film.
November left Kingford covered in a blanket of white snow, presenting special problems to the transport organisations. The winter weather, however, enabled Epping Forest to take on a new beauty, while for the young, it was a time for thrills. It's a snowy finale to our 1969 look at Chingford. An unlit Christmas tree on Chingford Green symbolised a gloomy start for 1974. In common with the rest of Britain, Chingford was suffering from the effects of a miners' dispute, resulting in restrictions in the use of electricity. For many, it was a three-day working week. There was also trouble on the railways, with an engine driver's work to rule and an overtime ban. And with the oil crisis as well, it was altogether a tarnished welcome for a brand new year. Happy New Year is the shop window message and with the Christmas trees still up, no time is lost in promoting the January sales. This is the scene in Chinkford Station Road on the first day of 1978. had their rubbish cleared, private households were not so lucky. No collections for a fortnight over the busy Christmas and New Year holidays. But essentially, it was to be the year of the forest, for 1978 marked the 100th anniversary of the Epping Forest Act. The act which has preserved 6,000 beautiful acres for all time. And if the traditional forest transport is too leisurely for you, you could always try out your Christmas present and skateboard around Chingford Green. And on Chingford Green, the hornbeam that local residents had planted as their tribute to the Jubilee Year of the Queen. So a young forest tree is born.
Tuesday evening, November 28, and it's late night shopping at Woolworths South Chingford. But the customers are extra special, for if you are disabled or confined to a wheelchair, Christmas shopping is not easy. But thanks to Chingford Round Table, assisted by the Red Cross and the St John's Ambulance Brigade, and with the cooperation of Woolworths management and staff, a crowd free shopping evening was arranged. Staff were on hand with guidance. Sherry was provided by the round table and refreshments by Woolworths. If you can't solve the ever-present problem of present giving, there's always a gift voucher. For those who normally find shopping difficult, these uncrowded conditions even make paying a pleasure. Chingford Green, Saturday, December 16, and shoppers and passers-by join local church members and the Salvation Army Band in a carol service. <laughs> Meanwhile, at Chingford Station, youngsters gather as the yellow Rolls Royce of local restaurateur Dennis Chasney is prepared to receive two special visitors. Father and Mother Christmas, helped on this occasion by lollipop man Ernie Mercer and Hetty Brogdon. Yes. They received a warm welcome as they journeyed to their Christmas caravan in Station Road. Hello, dear. Hello. Hello. <laughs> 
at the caravan, there was a long queue, waiting with their Christmas requests. It wasn't to be a white Christmas, but by the end of the year, the snow had arrived and so had a long wait for buses. Expected but heavy snow also produced problems for the railway. of the petrol driver's strike didn't help either. But our final New Year's Eve look at Chinkford must be this, for after all, it had been the year of the forest. During the winter of 81-82, weather conditions in Chingford were the worst experienced for years. From November to February, winter gripped an Ice Age Chingford. This was the snowy scene in January 1982. First day of December, a North Chingford Traders Association expressed their Christmas greetings as they prepare to light up Station Road. Guests included the Mayor and Mayoress, Derek and Pat Arnold, and of course, Father Christmas. I was going to have 
happen at the end of the year, they're going to ask me, what was your most embarrassing moment? I should say, waiting at the outside the assembly hall to switch the lights on without a switch. But nevertheless, we've got to thank the Chingford traders for putting lights up in Chingford. Hopefully, you'll all go and spend your money in the shops and make it all worth their while. But yeah. congratulations to the Chingford traders. I only wish we could do it everywhere in the borough. And I wish you all a Merry Christmas. Thank you very much. in February could be accepted as part of winter but when there is a Christmas card scene in April then perhaps there is something wrong. This was North Chingford on Saturday April 27 1985. of Chingford Parish Church celebrated a record Christmas with their best-selling seasonal LP, Christmas from Chingford. The first 600 copies were quickly sold and a further 500 had to be produced. Record's colourful sleeve is based on a wintry photograph by local artist Tom Price. Colour too in the festive lights provided by North Chingford Traders Association. From the end of November until Christmas Eve, Chingford Mount Baptist Church on the corner of Leedale Road was the home for local radio cracker, which broadcast around the clock with sponsored requests to raise money for aid and development projects in the third world. Disc jockeys included 22-year-old Fiona Maidman from Hyams Park and 27-year-old Paula Nelson from Walthamstow. You're listening to Radio Cracker. 
Care on the Air. This is Gary Davis from BBC Radio 1, asking you to donate as much as you can to help underprivileged children around the world. Remember, tune in, pay out. Thank you, Gary. Thank you, Gary. Right, OK, now I'm going to give you those very important numbers. Remember, this is Radio Cracker on 100.6 FM, and we are at the corner of Chinkford Mount, that's the Baptist Church, at Leedale Avenue and Old Church Road. That's right, right in the corner, so you can't miss us. OK, so those numbers, we have a phone number for the studio, so you can ring us direct here. We'd love to hear from you. Stay tuned to 100.6 FM, first of all. And if you want to get, make a donation, then please ring this is not the new studio phone number for a dedication. That's 0860 327 824. And your donations for dedication should be sent to 80 Palmerston Road. That's London E17. And please make your check payable to Radio Cracker. So stay tuned and please hang out. <laughs> November and snow came unexpectedly to Chinkford. This was the back garden scene in Horsley Row. And now Pretoria Crescent. And the adjoining Scholars Road. And at the War Memorial, the recently planted crosses were surrounded with the early winter snow. Snow was a visitor to Chinkford in mid-February 1994. This was the scene in Horsley Road. And now Mark Avenue. And this was Pole Hill. Stow Avenue, North Circular Road, Sainsbury's, opened its doors to the public on Tuesday, April 26. The store has been a success for Sainsbury's. At Christmas, trade was 20% head of budget, with beers, wines and spirits, the biggest sale of the 70 Sainsbury's in the region, which stretches from North East London to East Anglia. On Christmas Eve, shortly after opening, there were only eight fresh turkeys left, a further 150 had to be delivered from a Sainsbury's hypermarket, and they too were sold within 15 minutes. It's all a far cry from the first Chickford Sainsbury's, which opened in Old Church Road in 1937 with 50 staff... <laughs> It was a snowy welcome to 1995 in Chinkford. This was the scene in North Chinkford Scholars Road. And now the nearby Haverhill Road. Whilst on the slopes of Pole Hill, youngsters enjoyed the seasonal fun.
Peacham Hall at the top of Kingshead Hill was the subject of a planning permission application for demolition to be replaced by a house and a garage. Snow covered the area around the War Memorial and also Chingford Green. including the churchyard of St. Peter and St. Paul. And now the assembly hall. Thursday, December 28, an early morning snow and ice brought chaos to the area as traffic got stuck. This was Kingshead Hill. For youngsters on Pole Hill, it was a wonderful way to end the year 2000. The village of Church End, Walthamstow. It lies only a quarter of a mile from the town's main shopping centre, but still retains a rural atmosphere. The vestry house, built in 1730 as a workhouse, is today the home of Waltham Forest's local history museum. And on Wednesday, August 2, members of Chingford Historical Society visited the museum as one of the events to mark the 50th anniversary of the Society. The special display included the programme of the incorporation of Chingford as a borough in September 1938. An early photograph of the Bullen Crown. And the Green Man. The Society's own collection is now housed at the museum. Other events to mark the Golden Jubilee of the Historical Society included detailed walks around the Station Road area conducted by committee member Dick Richards. He pointed out the Victorian post box which stands in the Station Yard. Also, the great this was Chingford Station in the late 19th century. Dick Richards went on to describe the site of the Doric Cinema. A lot of people say it was the Doric because the pavilion was its first name. And I used to spend a lot of my boarding days in there. And now Winnie Bassett. His haberdashery shop in Station Road closed in 1980 after 42 years of service to local customers. We found Winnie happily enjoying her retirement at Ewley in Gloucestershire. Thank you. 
Winnie's scrapbook contains many photographs of her shop. She also cherishes the newspaper cutting, reporting about the film Akel made about her retirement. Meanwhile, in Station Road in the summer of 1989, Dick Richards is recalling the few family shops which still remain, like Warren's. Jubilee Retreat, Connell Avenue, Connell Road, Jubilee Villas, Pretoria Road, that must have four war uh, associations in Pretoria Road. As Dick said, many of the streets have patriotic names, but we are still in Station Road, and this was how it looked at the turn of the century. Eight years later, and little had changed. And now the scene in 1923. On now to the 60s. Uglows is another Station Road family business which still survives. And in Willow Street can be seen an original hayloft. Looking up Station Road from Willow Street in 1907. A bit further down, and certainly before 1903. The Smithy in the 1880s, opposite the site of Chingford Library. Dick Richards' tour continued with a reminder that the Roman Catholic Church was built on the site of Bartrip's house and coal office, which in turn moved to the King's Road, Pretoria Road site of Chingford Fire Station. And now the Bull and Crown, as it was about 1890. By the 60s, the King's Road, Station Road Junction looked like this. Dick Richards' informative tour of the Station Road area ended by the Assembly Hall. OK, hello everyone. Hope you've enjoyed the, uh, the intermission and enjoyed part one. Now for part two, we have something completely different, as they uh, so memorably say. Um, we've got here some footage, some adverts, and some footage of the Harris Liebus Furniture Factory in Tottenham in 1955. Now, I myself remember Butility at Edmonton, and my mum used to work there at one point. But Harris Liebus were their sort of contemporaries or, or competitors uh, based at Tottenham. So what we've got here are some adverts from the time for their range of uh, furniture, and followed by um, a silent film of a visit to their works by then Prince Philip in 1955. So a royal visit to the furniture factory. Thinking of linking for life. 
looking for somewhere to live. Found a flat or a house with a kitchen like this. Feeling depressed? Then think of Link and cheer up. Look, it's better already. The colors are made to link together, like this. Or like this. Doors slide smoothly and open soundlessly. All working surfaces are plastic and all the rest is seasoned wood. Happy linking. Thinking of linking for life? Then think about link furniture, which is also for life. In your dream home, you'd be at your dressing table and you'd be happy with all that space in a wardrobe that links with other link furniture. The silvery finish to this lovely wood is called chinchilla. The catalogue shows you a different design in warm tola wood. When you go shopping for link for any room in your flat or house, you'll find it costs less than any other good contemporary furniture. Happy linking. Thinking of linking for life? Then think about link. Link furniture, which is also for life. Take a trip into your dream home, furnished with link. You can buy it piece by piece, linking it together. And when you have a dining room of your own, link furniture can either match the lounge or contrast with it. The pale silvery finish to this lovely wood is called chinchilla. See how well it links with traditional furniture. Ask for the Link catalog and you will find that Link costs less than any other good contemporary furniture. Happy Link.
So uh, yes, so anyway, so that's, that's then. Now, last one here. We bring the clock forward to 1971, and this is another Acorn production. Uh, I took a break from making newsreel films and uh, made a short documentary uh, describing a potted history of the hunting lodge. Suddenly, London is left behind and the great grey metropolis spreads out to an ever-changing tapestry of colour and beauty. The tired Londoner has found his forest. Once a royal hunting ground, today the 6,000 remaining acres of Epping Forest belong to the City of London, providing happiness and relaxation for countless visitors. And here, on the edge of the forest, stands this ancient hunting lodge, which was once known as the Great Standing. Today, it is difficult to imagine that some 10,000 years ago, when the Great Ice Sheet extended down to Essex, this beautiful forest was a snow-swept Arctic waste. Over the years, as the climate grew milder, the landscape changed. First, the willow grew, followed by the pines, which eventually gave way to the oaks. It was not until around the 13th century that the great forest of Essex, known then as Waltham Forest, became an area for pleasure and pageantry for the privileged few. It was in the 16th century when the great forest of Essex covered the larger part of the county. Game and wildlife roamed freely. In those days, the term forest was technical and legal, applying to the areas subject to forest laws. In 1444, Humphrey, Duke of Gloucester, then Chief Warden of the Forest, issued a warrant for a standing to be built. But it was a century later that a lodge was built on Dannets Hill. Splendid oaks growing abundantly in the forest were to be used for its construction. And it was from these L-shaped foundations that the building grew. The ground floor consisted of three separate living rooms, the entrance being on the west side. The only windows in the building were on this floor. Three on the west side, two in the north return wall, and the other here. The space under the stairs had iron bars at the openings and may have been used as a lockup. The upper floors were open between the main timbers and the building was finished with a gable-ended high pitch roof, ordered as part of the equipment was a pair of stocks. For the first Queen Elizabeth who reigned for the 45 years from 1558, the lodge was to become a favourite retreat. Fond of stag hunting and reported to have been no mean shot with the crossbow, the Queen and her courtiers fired at the deer from the top floor, after they had been driven to the lodge. The minions had to be content with a middle floor vantage point. The Queen, who continued to hunt until she was 57, was delighted to hear her courtiers address her as Diana of the Woods. About the year 1660, very thorough repairs were necessary. The openings around the upper two floors were filled in, windows added, and the whole building plastered, giving it a totally different appearance. Over the years, hunting was to continue in the forest, methods changing with the times. The lodge then assumed a more mundane role and for centuries was occupied by families of underkeepers. The large room on the first floor being divided by thin oak partitions into three smaller rooms and used as bedrooms. The first forest keepers were given the job of protecting the forest.
As the years passed and styles changed, the lodge maintained the role of a residence and from 1720 to 1890 was occupied by a family of underkeepers by the name of Watkins. In the latter part of this time, uh, Mrs. Watkins, who had been widowed, used the lodge as a tea room, but eventually moved to the barn next door, now known as Butler's Retreat. Extensive repairs were carried out in 1879 and a forced timber facing added in 1896. Gradually, the forest was reduced by successive encroachments and in order to prevent it becoming obliterated, the City of London intervened and after an extended lawsuit, they purchased all the remaining forest land. And on the 6th of May, 1882, Queen Victoria came to Chingford Station and journeyed to High Beach. And from a crimson and gold stand, the forest was dedicated for the use and enjoyment of the public for all time. And amid rejoicing, a great legacy was handed over. Epping Forest had been saved. Fourteen years later, in 1896, the Essex Field Club used part of the hunting lodge as a forest museum. And in a further restoration, the plastering was removed from the chimney and the brickwork repointed. cement rendering was brought to an inch and a half below the timber line. The lath and plaster encasing the studs was removed and the window frames inserted. The gables were fitted with decorative barge boards pierced with trefoil openings. Today, the lodge attracts over 20,000 visitors a year. Just inside the doorway is a permanent reminder of John Thomas Bedford, the man primarily responsible in inducing the City of London to save Epping Forest for the public. Showcases on the ground floor include displays of Roman pottery discovered at the site of the settlement at nearby Chigwell. Information concerning the prehistory of Epping Forest and landscape, exhibits of forest remains and querns. From the ground floor, the heavy chamfered ceiling beams spanning the whole frame can be clearly seen. Also, a collection of interesting Iron Age implements and miscellany from four centuries. Other showcases display much from the natural life of Epping Forest, including various types of trees and forest flowers. The massive staircase, six feet wide, which Queen Elizabeth is said to have ridden up when news of victory over the Armada came through. Each stair consists of a solid oak sill. The door to the oak room with its original Tudor frame and four-centred head with foliated spandrels, incised to suggest a curved leaf. The flower in centre on right was unfinished, possibly due to superstitious custom so as not to let the devil in. In the oak room there are displays of butterflies, moths, dragonflies and beetles and many fine examples of forest inhabitants.
small mammals, reptiles, squirrels, foxes, stoats, badgers, and of course the famous Epping Forest deer, one of the few herds of dark fallow deer in England. The ceiling beams have fine moulding. On now to the top floor. The well is enclosed by a wooden partition from the ground almost to the roof. The well-framed doorway is vertically in line with that on the first floor. According to tradition, it was from this room that Queen Elizabeth I watched the hunt. Today, it houses many examples of the bird population to be found in the forest. The fine, open, timber roof structure of the type termed arch to collar, wherein the roof's pitches rest upon an arch formed by two curved timbers, one springing from each wall. Short spur ties locate the top plates at the line of the eaves. A central purlin was formerly fitted through the collars, the mortises for which are still visible. And in this showcase, some excellent diagrams and illustrations detailing various phases in the construction of the building. The fireplace was fitted in 1882 to mark the opening of Epping Forest by Queen Victoria. There are also exhibits of many of the woodland birds to be found in the forest, such as finches, larks, warblers, nuthatch, tree creeper woodpeckers, hawks, owls, jays and wood pigeons. Just outside the door is a raised platform, which could have been used as a horse block. For a number of years, a donkey was kept at the lodge so that visitors could emulate the legendary feat of the first Queen Elizabeth by riding up the stairs. And so, from an atmosphere of yesteryear, of the history and tradition of the centuries, we return to this modern age of speed and noise, to leave this ancient monument to tell its own story, casting a romantic spell of the past on all who enter and look around. And we'll, I think that's about it, really. <laughs> so, thank, thank you very much. <laughs>